I'm now going to move on to the presentation uh, part and talk about ocean observations, uh, how they're coordinated and why they're relevant for society. So just uh, by way of introduction, uh, my organization, uh, which is POGO, the Partnership for Observation of the Global Oceans, is a consortium of major oceanographic institutes around the world represented by their directors, as you saw uh, some of them in, in that video. POGO's vision is to have, by 2030, worldwide cooperation for a sustainable state-of-the-art global ocean observing system that serves the needs of science and society. And POGO's mission is to firstly lead innovation and development of the crucial components of the ocean observing system. Secondly, to identify and contribute to the development of the key skills, capabilities and capacities needed to achieve the vision. And thirdly, to work with governments, foundations and industry to articulate the benefits to society and the required funding to build and sustain the system. So in summary, the three pillars of, of POGO's mission are uh, ocean observations, capacity building, and uh, outreach and advocacy. So we have uh, many members, uh, which are uh, well-known oceanographic institutions. I'm sure you're, some of you come from these. Uh, you'll also be familiar with, with many of these. We have, uh, at the moment, 37 members from uh, 19 different countries. And uh, currently we have our, our largest gap in representation really is on the African continent, which POGO is, is working to, to address this at the moment. So one of the uh, very strong pillars of, of POGO's uh, program is capacity building. This was defined from, from day one really in POGO through a declaration that was made in 2001 in POGO's uh, Sao Paulo meeting, it was called the Sao Paulo Declaration, which uh, underlined the uh, paucity in observations, particularly in the Southern Hemisphere, and uh, the lack of uh, trained personnel uh, in many parts of the world to be able to conduct ocean observations. So since then, we've developed a very strong capacity building program, uh, which provides training, um, but also um, some infrastructure or equipment for uh, institutions in developing countries and also networking opportunities. So, uh, so far we've provided training to around 800 uh, young scientists uh, from mostly developing countries, I think 77 different countries at the moment. So I'll just give a few examples of uh, training programs that we've had uh, over the years. One of the first ones was the POGO SCORE Visiting Fellowship. So this is um, a collaboration with the Scientific Committee on Oceanic Research. And it provides support for early career scientists from developing countries to visit oceanographic laboratories um, anywhere in the world, but quite often they're in developed uh, countries. Uh, for training periods of between one and three months. Uh, so the, this is professional training. It's uh, quite high level. Uh, quite often the trainees are PhD students or postdocs, and they're on a very specific uh, top research and observation topic. Uh, we've provided up to 15 fellowships per year uh, since 2001, with a total of over 160 fellowships provided so far. And we've also had a, a spin-off from that, which has been a, a visiting fellowship on board the Atlantic Meridional Transit Cruise, which was mentioned a few times this week. Uh, it's run by PML uh, principally, and it's allowed, um, again, young scientists to receive training uh, prior to the cruise, to join the cruise, to undertake uh, research um, sampling, analyses, and observations on board, and then to spend uh, another month after the cruise back at the host institute, so in most cases PML, um, working on the post-cruise analyses, uh, data interpretation, and so on. And these have quite a few times have resulted in joint publications between the trainee and the supervisor. So... We, since 2005, we've had a very strong collaboration with the Nippon Foundation, which is a philanthropic organization in Japan, uh, which is a very, very uh, 
major sponsor for capacity building in marine science. Um, I think the NF POGO program is one of 10 Nippon Foundation funded programs on marine science and policy. So we started off with a visiting professorship program which ran for two years. Um, there were six different visiting professorships conducted in six different countries and these were I think three weeks long and generally also included uh, the provision of equipment uh, so that the institute would be able to apply the knowledge that they'd gained from the training uh, in a sustained way. Uh, so then this initiative uh, metamorphosed into the uh, NFPOGO Centre of Excellence um, because it was decided that uh, it would be better to have a consolidated longer term programme in one place uh, and to bring students from around the world uh, to this Centre of Excellence. So the model for this program has been uh, 10 months of training in ocean observations provided to 10 students from 10 different countries every year and I think we're in year nine now. So it ran for four years at the uh, Bermuda Institute of Ocean Sciences and now it's, it's uh, been running at the Alfred Wegener Institute in Germany since uh, 2013. And in between, we developed, started to uh, create a network of the alumni from the various NFPOGO training programs uh, to be able to keep track of what the alumni or what the trainees um, become after the training, how they apply the knowledge, um, to see if it's helped them to, to develop their careers further, to be able to implement ocean observing programs in their, in their countries or in their institutes. Uh, and also to provide additional opportunities to them uh, in terms of networking, conducting uh, collaborative research projects with their colleagues from, from other countries in the network. So this has been uh, uh, quite successful um, in allowing us to continue interacting with, with our trainees. Um, so... Yeah, I, I won't dwell too much on on Nano, but it's we have it has its own website. It produces a newsletter twice a year, and we have a number of uh, research projects that are conducted by the alumni. So this is uh, an artistic depiction of of the global ocean observing system, which was commissioned by uh, Goose, the the the, the project. Uh, office of the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission, which deals with coordinating ocean observations at the global level. So it shows uh, various types of, of ocean observing platforms from the satellites to the ships, uh, moored buoys, Argo floats, uh, I think there are some gliders here, there's a continuous plankton recorder, uh, and various other uh, bits and pieces. And another interesting part of the, the ocean observing system is these um, temperature and salinity sensors that get stuck onto the heads of uh, various marine mammals So and then the data are transmitted uh, via satellites so we can um, basically use animals to, to measure um, temperature and salinity in the ocean but they, they don't mind. Um, here's a CTD showing how uh, we still rely on ships for for ocean observations, uh, glider, CPR, and so on. So this is a, a less artistic uh, depiction, but it's uh, this is produced by JCOM, which is another acronym to do with uh, ocean observations. It's a joint commission between. IOC and the World Meteorological Organization uh, that deals more with the, the technical side of uh, integrating ocean observations from between different platforms. So it brings together global programs like Argo, which um, you already know a lot about, um, uh, additions to Argo, <clears throat> which are more recent developments such as the deep Argo floats, which are designed to go down to 6,000 meters, biogeochemical Argo, um, which you've also heard about, which can now measure nutrients, oxygen, and pH, and so on. Uh, then there are 
the moored uh, buoy arrays in the in the tropical uh, Pacific, in the tropical Atlantic, uh, and in the Indian Ocean, uh, which are used very much for uh, weather and climate uh, modelling and observation. Uh, the Go Ship program, which is a repeat hydrography uh, global program. I don't know if you can see the lines on this map, but they represent the, uh, the, the, the ship cruise tracks, which are repeated on a regular basis, and they have standard protocols for all their measurements so that the data can be intercomparable. Uh, there's also GLOSS, which is a global uh, uh, sea level rise I can't remember exactly the acronym, but um, uh, to do with um, sea level measurements, uh, tide gauge network, basically. Uh, there's also a program, uh, SOUP, which is um, a sh uh, ship ship based. Um, well, I'm, I'm getting lost with all the acronyms. Uh, another ship based um, uh, system. Okay, so why ocean observations? Uh, all of you obviously work with uh, satellite data and ocean color data for, I'm guessing, mainly for research purposes, but it's increasingly important to be able to, to link uh, ocean observations with um, what is required by society and um, why, why these uh, observations are useful. So um, this diagram shows uh, what sustainable development is, is all about. So sustainable development is a term that sort of came about in around the early 70s, 80s uh, to, um, to describe how we need to balance the needs of environment, society and economy uh, in order to ensure that future generations will be able to continue living on this planet. So uh, ocean observations can and do provide services that are directly relevant to sustainable development in, in many different ways. So, for example, uh, ocean observations to do with uh, biodiversity uh, and ecosystem healthy ecosystems uh, will support a viable uh, marine environment. Um, all the observations to do with climate change uh, also obviously very uh, relevant for, for the environment and for um, the resilience of the environment towards climate change. Uh, there are many different kinds of ocean-based industries uh, that benefit from ocean observations such as fisheries, uh, oil and gas, shipping, uh, aquaculture and so on. Uh, things like uh, weather forecasts that are uh, based on ocean observations can be used for uh, risk mitigation uh, for economic purposes, uh, also for insurance and reinsurance. Uh, and then on the social side, um, the so-called um, blue economy, which provides uh, um, employment and supports livelihoods uh, in all over the world really, but particularly in uh, small island developing states. Uh, ocean observations are, uh, can support or help to improve uh, human health and public safety through things like uh, tsunami warning systems, um, uh, flood uh, forecasting and so on. And uh, obviously anything that helps fisheries and aquaculture, um, harmful algal bloom, uh, modeling and forecast can uh, contribute towards enhanced food security. So uh, changing the subject a little bit, uh, I'd just like to introduce a group on Earth Observations, GEO, uh, which is a voluntary partnership of governments and organizations that is working to link Earth observation resources worldwide for the benefit of society. Uh, 
using the motto, countries have borders, earth observations don't. GEO currently has 105 member countries and 115 participating organisations. And POGO is one of the participating organisations. Uh, IOC and GOOSE uh, are also participating organisations. So GEO started in 2005 and uh, they have always been working on uh, defining societal benefit areas and uh, trying to demonstrate how Earth observations are relevant for these uh, SBAs. So the, the, the revised uh, list of SBAs is the one that's shown here. Uh, it's slightly different from the one that uh, Marie showed uh, earlier this week. Uh, but again, uh, it's quite easy to show that ocean observations are relevant to pretty much all of these uh, SBAs. So for example, uh, for disaster resilience, there's tsunami warning and weather forecasting, uh, particularly for extreme weather events. Uh, for energy and mineral resources management, uh, ocean observations can be used for things like environmental impact assessments, uh, marine spatial planning, uh, particularly in the context of, um, at the moment, there's a lot of focus on deep sea mining and no one really knows what the effects uh, deep sea mining might have on deep sea communities. So, so there's quite a lot of focus on the need for deep ocean observations in relation to that. Uh, for food security and sustainable agriculture or aquaculture, uh, there are many different applications uh, of ocean observations, such as producing maps of potential fishing zones, um, SMS alerts that are, can be sent to fishermen, uh, and uh, things like uh, forecasts for aquaculture managers, and also for regulatory purposes. Uh, relating to infrastructure and transport management, uh, again, weather forecasting is essential for things like determining ship routes, uh, for oil spill uh, monitoring and forecasting. Uh, harmful algal bloom monitoring and forecasting, again, uh, is, is essential for uh, public health, um, trying to prevent public health uh, issues relating to uh, shellfish poisoning and so on. Uh, water quality monitoring uh, is relevant for uh, managing water resources and um, there are various uh, d uh, types of uh, sensitive habitats that need to be uh, monitored and, and protected such as coral reefs, mangroves and seagrasses. So going into acronym territory again, GEO has or is developing a Global Earth Observation System of Systems, which it calls GEOS. Uh, and to do this, uh, it has developed a what they call GEODAB, which is a GEO uh, Discovery and Access Broker. So <clears throat> the idea is to uh, provide access to existing sources of data and to facilitate access to those so GEO doesn't actually uh, hold any data itself. It um, discovers and provides access to existing sources of data and uh, acts as a broker, if you like. Uh, so GEO has a portal. Uh, I think the, the URL is geo, geoportal.org, uh, which is a, um, a web GIS system, uh, where, which is quite user-friendly, you can enter keywords and do searches in particular areas on the map uh, and so on. So that might be a useful resource for you. Uh, GEO also encourages uh, and supports the development of apps, uh, so things that can be used by, by citizens, uh, by anyone to either uh, find data products and services that they need or um, or actually to help uh, make observations themselves and co contribute them towards um, towards GEOS. So at the moment GEO is focusing on uh, contributing to relevant policy frameworks and has uh, 
it's kind of picked out three particular areas that where where it wants to contribute. So one is the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Another one is the Sendai Framework for Disaster, disaster Risk Reduction. And another one is the Paris Climate Change Agreement. Uh, although so far it's been focusing mostly on the SDGs, which I'll talk a bit more about. Uh, so I think you've already heard Claudia mentioned these yesterday. So the uh, SDGs uh, were launched in 2015, 2016 uh, as a roadmap created as part of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Uh, so these evolved actually from a previous uh, effort which was called the Millennium Development Goals which were adopted in 2000 and these were uh, setting measurable goals for global development including reducing extreme poverty, hunger and child mortality. Uh, the SDGs seem to have received more attention uh, globally and at uh, the political level than the, than the MDGs did. Uh, I'm not sure what the reason is for this, but one of the uh, main differences is that it, um, it highlights things such as increasing peace and justice, taking climate action, so there's a specific uh, SDG on climate, and there's also a specific SDG on protecting life below water, SDG 14. So the, the full title of SDG 14 is to conserve and sustainably use the ocean, seas and marine resources for sustainable development. Uh, this goal currently shows the least progress and it's only just started but already it's quite clear that the ocean community is going to struggle uh, to, to provide the information that's needed to monitor progress on this goal. Um, <clears throat> the, I mentioned here the uh, indicators uh, which uh, basically um, there are a number of targets under each goal and each target has one or more indicators that are proposed as ways to measure progress towards achievement of the target and the indicators are classed as different tiers in terms of how how ready the um, the methodologies are for measuring these indicators and I think all pretty much all of the SDG 14 indicators are the lowest possible tier um, meaning that we're not <laughs> in a very good position to measure um, the indicators uh, so the, the targets that come under SDG 14 are reducing pollution, restoring ecosystems, minimizing ocean acidification, ending overfishing, conserving coastal and marine areas, reforming fishery subsidies, and increasing benefits to small island developing states. And that <clears throat> there's been a, a report uh, by another Nippon Foundation program, the Nippon Foundation Nereus program, uh, which has looked at the co-benefits of achieving SDG 14 uh, relative to the other targets. So, so they've sort of mapped how um, SDG 14 uh, or progress in SDG 14 can contribute towards the other goals. So in particular, it highlights that it uh, will support goal one, which is uh, reducing poverty, goal two, which is uh, reducing hunger, uh, and then there's some contributions to to a few a few of the other um, SDGs. So Blue Planet was uh, is an initiative in the Group on Earth Observations uh, work program, and it was created to raise the visibility of oceans within Geo, and demonstrate the impact of oceans and ocean observations on all of the Geo. Uh, societal benefit areas, to increase linkages and collaborations across the various ocean observing groups and organizations, and to increase engagement with end users and support improved decision making. Blue Planet's mission is to advance and exploit synergies among ocean and coastal observation programs, to increase integration of and access to in situ and remote sensing ocean observation data, 
to improve engagement with a variety of users for enhancing the timeliness, quality and range of services and to raise awareness of the societal benefits of ocean observations at public and policy levels. So the overall goal uh, is to ensure that the sustained development and use of ocean and coastal observations for the benefit of society and in particular the, uh, it's not really a chain, but the cycle uh, from uh, determining user needs uh, to design observations that are fit for purpose and then transforming the data from these observations into products and information and ultimately knowledge uh, that are useful for society and then this feeds back into the uh, assessment of user needs. So the objectives uh, of Blue Planet um, are, t I can probably skip over this because they are basically in line with the, the four uh, bullets of the mission. So I'll just go over that. Uh, the Blue Planet themes, um, so these are cross-cutting themes across the uh, three pillars of, of sustainable development, which I mentioned earlier, which are environment, society, and economy. Uh, so we've, we've highlighted these four themes as being uh, foci of, of Blue Planet, where we all Blue Planet activities should fit under one or more of these themes. So this uh, diagram shows the, the geo-societal benefit areas uh, around the edge the uh, sustainable development pillars in the light blue and then uh, the themes that I just mentioned in dark blue and on the inside here are uh, four working groups which are designed to support Blue, blue Planet as a whole and Blue Planet activities and pilot projects and so on so they're things like uh, capacity building and advocacy which POGO is leading this working group uh, data integration and informatics information services and user engagement. Uh, I'll, I'll skip over this as well. This is just about what the, what the working groups, um, ha how they will operate. Uh, and then I'll just show a couple of examples of, of what Blue Planet, uh, of Blue Planet projects. So one is uh, to help uh, organizations in the Caribbean to develop a multi-purpose marine mon monitoring mechanism. So this is a collaboration uh, between Blue Planet and uh, UNDP Barbados uh, and um, various other uh, regional organizations. Uh, so the idea is to uh, support Caribbean SIDS by providing technology for effective monitoring of the marine environment increasing capacity for marine data collection and analysis, improving access to real-time data in the region, increase data sharing in the region, and establish, ultimately, a data platform for the region. Uh, so also, as part of its contribution to, towards the whole SDG process, uh, we decided to start by focusing on the Caribbean again uh, to try to uh, hold a workshop where inviting stakeholders uh, from uh, uh, Caribbean uh, governments as well as uh, scientists and people from the general public to try to find out uh, what sort of support they might need uh, to be able to meet these sustainable development goals uh, in, their, in their own countries. So we've managed to get some funding from NASA to hold a workshop uh, early next year uh, on implementing and monitoring the uh, sustainable development goals in the Caribbean. So it's looking at all sustainable de development goals, not just SDG 14, um, as the ocean is obviously, as I mentioned, relevant to, to many of the SDGs. So just to finish off, uh, I, I just wanted to... Uh, provide uh, or share a testimonial that I received from one of our uh, former trainees who attended the uh, NF Pogo Center of Excellence in Bermuda back in 2009, 2010, I think, uh, and also to show how he's gone on to, to do something that's relevant 
to Blue Planet and everything else I've been talking about. So <clears throat> he, uh, he commented that participating in this program not only enhanced his knowledge and skills of the marine environment, but afforded him the opportunity to network with uh, his colleague participants, the tutors, and also other Pogo scholars from different year groups from all over the world. And he continues to benefit from the enormous resources that are shared by this network of scholars. And ultimately, participating in the program uh, made it easy for him to, uh, to adapt to different aspects of ocean monitoring. Uh, in his scientific career, he was initially involved in biogeochemical aspects of oceanography, such as monitoring plankton, water quality, and heavy trace metals. But more recently, he's been involved in the use of Earth observation information to monitor and forecast ocean conditions with respect to ocean waves, currents, and winds, and disseminating this information automatically to fishermen via SMS to support safety at sea. And this is part of the marine theme of the Monitoring for Environment and Security in Africa, MISA project, which is sponsored by the European Union uh, and executed by the Uni University of Ghana since 2014. And then he also sent me a, a testimonial from a fisherman who benefits from this service, who said that uh, the SMS messages has, have saved his life and, and those of his crew, as well as their investment on a number of occasions um, when they didn't go to sea because they received these alerts of uh, dangerous weather conditions. And the SMS service also helped them to conserve fuel since they're able to determine when not to go to sea. Uh, therefore improving their livelihoods. So I just wanted to end on that kind of positive note of how uh, ocean observations providing training first of all can help developing countries and then the ocean observations themselves if used properly can can actually um, help to save lives and improve um, quality of life around the world. So thank you very much. I don't know if there's time for questions but um, uh, yeah, feel free to come and find me afterwards if not. Thank you.